The dog's original destiny in this world was to be a working animal and a companion to man. No matter what the breed, they were all adapted by man to serve him. Until the end of the 19th century, most dogs really did have to work hard for their keep. And it was necessary to have good confirmation to be able to do the job required of them. The advent of our technological age has, in many cases, taken away the dog's original job, so that for many breeds, the practical test of the dog's ability to do the job it was bred for, how well it works, is no longer possible. Today, the dog show and field trials are the principal testing grounds of breeders' ability to produce dogs capable of performing the job each breed was created for. In the ring, a judge is seeking the animal whose structure most closely resembles the ideal called for in the breed standard. Gait, the way in which a dog moves, reveals much about structure. Sound movement is a prerequisite for any animal of real quality. The purpose of this film is to analyze the ways in which dogs move so that we may all better appreciate and understand this key element in the search for that elusive creature, the ideal dog. All dogs do not move alike. Structural variations greatly influence the way in which a specific breed puts its feet down. Massively built bulldog with a low center of gravity and wide front tapering to a narrow rear does not move like the Irish wolfhound with his very long legs and muscular physique or like the Bichon with his stylish dignity. No matter what the breed, tall or short, big or small, the basic structure which enables them to move is determined by nature not the individual quirks man has bred into them. Every dog is attempting to move forward with the least amount of effort, and effortless movement is good movement. The less effort he wastes, the better able he is to do the job for which he was bred. Anything that detracts from efficient movement can be considered a fault, whether it results from injury, poor structure, or bad habits. In the next few minutes, we will be seeing examples of what is generally agreed to be good or bad in terms of movement. Faults and virtues vary in severity and frequency from dog to dog and breed to breed. They occur in all breeds. The ability to recognize correct and incorrect movement is an essential element of every dog fancier's knowledge. Movement is often quicker than the eye can follow. The confined spaces and limited time available in the show ring are far from ideal for accurately evaluating any animal's gait. But the educated eye, the eye that knows what to look for, will not be easily misled. It is important not just to look at a dog in motion, but to really see how that dog moves and to understand why he moves that way. Modern photographic techniques make it possible to slow down what the eye sees in a twinkling to half speed, or even four times as slow as reality. The slow motion and other visual techniques used in this film are aids to our understanding. In real life, we have to use practice, experience, careful observation, and critical evaluation to arrive at true comprehension and appreciation of the way a dog moves.
knowledge of dogs includes being familiar with the qualities which make a breed unique, and more generally, an understanding of a dog's structure. All dogs have the same bones, tied together by the same muscles and ligaments. The way those bones are shaped and positioned determines the dog's build. The more detailed one's knowledge of animal anatomy, the better. The quality of a dog's movement depends on the coordination between the front and rear assemblies. In the front are the scapula or shoulder blade and humerus or upper arm. Between the tops of the shoulder blades are the withers. The point where the scapula and humerus come together is the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is one of the most important elements in a well-built dog. The humerus or upper arm is connected to the radius and ulna or forearm at the elbow joint, which is relatively close to the chest of the dog. The forearm in turn connects to a series of bones forming the wrist and feet at the carpal joint, also referred to as the pastern joint in the dog. The rear assembly begins with the vital hip joint, the place where the pelvis or hip bone connects with the femur. The femur connects to the tibia and fibula at the knee or stifle joint. The tibia and fibula connect with the lower leg and foot at the hock joint. Of course, all parts of a dog's skeletal structure are vital in determining its conformation and ability to move. Angulation and balance are fundamental in evaluating the overall dog. In dog structure, the term angulation refers mainly to the angles formed at the shoulder and hip joints, the stifle and the hock. The shoulder and hip joints are formed by long, strong bones. A dog with proper angulation will tend to have a smoother stride than a less well-angulated dog. Authorities have generally concurred that for most breeds, the ideal angle formed by the shoulder and hip joints is 90 degrees, with the shoulder blade set at a 45 degree slant off the horizontal and the pelvis at a 30 degree slant off the horizontal. The frequently invoked phrase, shoulders well laid back, is generally taken to mean approximately this ideal. How well a dog's angulation approaches the theoretical ideal brings in the second key element in relating structure to gait, balance. Balance means a dog of proper proportion, that is, the relative proportion of the parts to each other. In discussing movement, balance has a particular meaning. A dog that has approximately the same angulation at the shoulder and hip joints. When a dog's angulation is approximately the same fore and aft, it will have the same amount of reach in the forelegs as in the rear. Many elements of structure have a bearing on gait, but an understanding of the principles of angulation and balance is essential in assessing a dog's ability to move. Dogs move in many ways at many speeds. When walking, three legs are on the ground and supporting the dog as one leg is moved forward in regular sequence. Right front, left hind, left front, right hind, and so on. As the dog moves into a trot, the sequence changes. The trot and the pace are both two-beat gates. This dog is pacing. A pacing dog moves both legs on the same side of the body as a pair. It is a lateral gait and considered incorrect in the American show ring. 
Pacing causes a side-to-side -side rolling motion of the dog's body. Pacing is influenced by the relative length of back to leg. That is, a dog too short for his height is inclined to pace in order to keep the rear legs from interfering with the front. Pacing may also be the result of injury or fatigue. The trot is the most common gait when attempting to evaluate how a dog moves. The trot is a two-beat diagonal gait. The feet at diagonal opposite ends of the body touch the ground together. Right hind and left front, left hind and right front, and so on. Because only two feet touch the ground at any time, the dog relies on forward momentum to maintain balance, with the hind feet tending to fall in or along the tracks left by the front feet. In the flying trot, all four feet are off the ground for an instant. It is a faster gait than the regular trot, but not as fast as the flat-out gallop in which the dog hurdles his body through the air with all four feet actually off the ground twice during the stride. This greyhound started at a canter and is now in a full gallop. As you watch this joyful Saluki, you will see that all four feet are off the ground when fully contracted and when fully extended. Observing dogs in motion is complicated by the restrictions and limitations of handlers and leads, not to mention the often restricted confines of the show ring. We should all be aware of these problems and do as much as we can to eliminate or minimize them. Dog and handler are a team, and too frequently, through intent or lack of attention or not understanding what he or she is doing, a handler will confuse a dog's movement. Loose lead, please, is a phrase well worth bearing in mind. It is simply not possible to properly assess how a dog moves when it is strung up on a lead so tight its feet barely touch the ground. Notice how much more naturally the dog on the loose lead is moving in comparison with the strung up Westie. A good handler will use the lead to make a dog pay attention to business without inhibiting his ability to move as well as he is able. Handlers seem too frequently to think the faster a dog is moved, the better. It's not necessarily so. Every dog has a best speed. This dog is being gated too fast, accentuating his tendency to overreach. As the handler slows down, the dog comes into his best trotting speed. Now, in reverse, the contrast is even more graphic. For analytical purposes, there are three ways to observe all dogs in motion. Coming, going, from the side. Each reveals something of the dog and its ability to move. Good movement can be described. It can be analyzed point by point. But in the final analysis, it is something to be appreciated for its beauty, its fluidity and smoothness, its coordination, efficiency, and balance, its symmetry and style. Almost everyone can recognize a great moving dog, just as poor moving dogs are immediately apparent by their awkwardness and lack of grace. Most dogs are near the average in quality. It is in evaluating these animals that the trained eye is important.
Many faults and virtues can be detected by viewing the dog gating from the side, but do not allow this to suffice. Watching the same dog gate from the rear may tell a different story. When observing a dog from the side, try to first get an overall impression and then zero in on the various particulars of his gait. Foot timing is important. There should be proper coordination between hind and front feet, with the front foot moving away smoothly as the hind foot comes down. The dog may be overreaching, with the rear feet passing outside or inside the front feet. Look for good extension in front, with the foot coming well out under the muzzle. Notice how the paws move in an elliptical pattern with no wasted motion. The paw actually strikes the ground slightly to the rear of its point of furthest extension. These two dandies provide an interesting contrast. Although each is taking the same number of steps in the same amount of time, the one on the left leaves his companion behind. Better extension and balance make him more efficient. Watch the carriage of the head, neck, and back. The spinal column should appear as a gentle curve moving forward with no wasted up and down or sideways action, particularly at the withers and croup. Poor head and neck carriage contribute to awkward, inefficient movement. The rear quarters give the dog forward thrust and drive. The entire rear leg should extend and flex through the hocks to drive the dog forward. Watch for stiff and inflexible action, or sickle hocks, with little or no extension in the rear. Going and coming also reveal many things about a dog's gait. The dynamics of motion impose certain tendencies on all dogs. Normally, as the speed increases from a walk to a trot, the feet reach toward a center line of travel beneath the body so that both front and rear tracks fall almost along a straight line. This has been described as the tendency to single track. Height, width of body, and length of leg influence this tendency. But to a greater or lesser degree, the legs of all dogs tend to converge as speed increases in order to maintain balance. There are, of course, breeds that, because of anatomy, cannot single track, as the double-tracking corgi or the four-tracking bulldog. But all of them show the tendency. The tendency for the feet fore and aft to converge in motion is not the same as moving close in the rear or crossing or weaving in the front. In watching dogs coming and going, two key concepts help differentiate efficient correct movement from the incorrect. The first concept is that the leg assembly provides a single column of support from its articulation with the shoulder or hip joint to the pad as it strikes the ground. This does not mean perpendicular, but a straight line from shoulder to pad. The second key concept is the parallel movement of the legs on the same side of the body. They should move in parallel planes. Notice how the front leg obscures the hind leg. They are moving in the same plane. The hind foot strikes in almost the same spot as the front foot on the same side. Any deviation, inward or outward, from this moving single column of support is faulty. 
It could be caused by a structural problem, such as loose shoulders, or twisting hocks, or cow hocks. The way in which dogs move comprises many more things than gait alone. Just for a moment, let's pay attention to some other facets of dog movement. Before looking into the multitude of defects that detract from correct efficient gait, it is important to remember that analysis is based on a detailed examination of the parts of a dog, while the dog in motion is the sum of its many parts. Often the overall impression given by balance, symmetry, and proper conditioning is more important than any individual flaw but it is still vital to recognize and understand the faults that limit good ground covering action. Slow motion photography highlights many faults that would be obvious to the experienced eye at normal speed. We make use of it in this film to make those faults obvious to all. Perhaps the most common fault is overreaching. Overreaching occurs when the rear legs extend so far forward as to pass the front legs. As this happens, the dog must compensate in some way to avoid striking the front feet. One form of compensating is to swing the rear leg into a different plane from the front, so as to strike slightly outside or inside the front foot. A more extreme compensation is to swing the hindquarters to one side on a bias to the line of travel. This is called crabbing, for obvious reasons. Overreaching and crabbing have many causes, such as poor extension in front combined with too much drive from behind, or too short a body combined with a stiff back. Structural imbalance also shows up in other forms of compensation. Hackneying as a fault means extra high action in the front due to steep shoulders. The high action keeps the rear legs from striking the front feet. It is inefficient and tiring. The miniature pincher has been developed to a natural hackney action. The min pin is properly built to show exaggerated bend of knee and hock. This should not be confused with hackneying as a fault in other breeds. The term hackney comes from the natural gait of the hackney horse. Note this horse's layback of shoulder and smooth action at the withers and along the spine, which is what you look for in a natural hackney gait. Padding is another form of compensation for overdrive from behind. In this case, the dog flicks or extends the feet upward, thus keeping the front legs out of the way of the rear as they come down. From head on, the pads will be visible with each step. Aside from being out at the elbows, this dog is winging. Winging is the swinging of the front foot outward by turning the pastern inward to avoid the rear foot. This dog is towing in. Towing in is the inward slant of the paw, breaking the single column of support. A common cause of faulty gating is poor shoulder construction. Shoulders that are not properly laid back restrict extension in the front, which must be compensated for unless the dog is equally steep in the rear. This is an extremely steep shoulder. Notice that the angle of shoulder and arm is much greater than that considered desirable for efficient movement. 
Extremely straight shoulders, combined with more reach from behind, can result in severe pounding. The forefeet strike the ground directly beneath the shoulder, causing jerkiness in the muscles and too much up and down action at the withers. At ease, the front assembly of most breeds should form two parallel columns from the forearm to the ground when viewed from the front. Action that breaks this column of support is faulty. Loose or wobbling shoulders may also cause problems at the elbows. Elbowing out is the result of incorrect structure and is often accentuated by poor conditioning. Paddling sometimes occurs in combination with loose elbows, but is usually the result of elbows that are tied in, constricting the shoulder and making the footfall wide. Other faults caused by poor front structure are weaving or crossing, and here's a beautiful example. This kind of movement is sometimes called knitting and purling. Weak pasterns give too much as weight is put on them, causing a great deal of strain on the joints and ligaments involved. East-west front, in which the feet are turned outwards, is another frontal weakness that results in poor movement. Knuckling is the tilting forward at the wrist, as seen in this Bassett's left front foot, weakening the column of support. Just as structural faults of the front end are reflected in the dog's gait, so too are problems in the rear. Cow hocks, where the hocks are turned in, greatly impair efficient movement. Cow hocks cause a pitching motion of the croup with a resulting loss of drive. Sickle hocks, where there is lack of flexion at the hock joint, reduces thrust and there is often little or no backstroke in the lower leg. Spread or barrel hocks is the opposite of cow hocks and are equally inefficient in action. Twisting hocks are weak, causing a twisting or side-to-side -side action as the weight comes down on the foot. This is different from cow hocks and spread hocks, where the joint construction is awry, while a twisting hock shows up when the dog is in motion. Moving close occurs when the hocks move too close to each other. In extreme cases, the legs may cross, or the hocks actually interfere with each other. Faults are many and varied. They appear in all degrees of severity. In extreme cases, animals may be faulty from stem to stern, and while not actually cripples, illustrate a multitude of physical problems. Poor top line, pounding, steep shoulder, cow hocks, elbows out, loose shoulder, east-west front,